You're listening to The Growing Season, a podcast from Arkansas PBS. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Eating is an agricultural act. Kentucky farmer and author Wendell Berry said that in his 1989 essay, The Pleasures of Eating. Why, just a few months ago, Arkansas Secretary of Agriculture Wes Ward echoed that sentiment on this very podcast. And making sure that the, those, those producers in the industry that provides that food, fiber, fuel, and shelter that we depend on every single day can continue to do their job and provide that for us every single day is, is just incredibly important. It isn't surprising food is the first thing on that list. What Barry and Ward understand is with every bite, we become members in the agricultural cycle driving our state, this country, and the entire world. However, Barry argues while many of us fill our pantries with store-bought food and spend our weekends at our favorite restaurants, we've forgotten almost everything we eat is thanks to a farmer. He calls this cultural amnesia. Some might say, well, I live in town. If I live near a farm, it'd be a lot easier for me to eat healthy. But it isn't always that simple. Our stories this month find our farmers struggling to maintain a healthy diet in the face of financial stress and busy schedules, even with fresh meat and produce being raised right outside the kitchen window. Later, we'll speak with registered dietitian and nutritionalist Chelsea Tull on how the compounded struggles of poor diet, physical labor, and persistent stress can have real detrimental effects on the human body. The table is set, so let's dig in on the growing season. For agritourism operations like Dogwood Hills Farm, the relationship between community and food is key to their mission. Sharing dinners with guests, Grace and Ruthie Pepler are constantly working the riddle of keeping their menu local, seasonal, and above all, interesting. If someone is disappointed with a meal, it might sour their experience on the farm, or even worse, their perspective on the lifestyle. With so much riding on each plate of food, every dinner counts. Producer Jordan Hickey has the story. It's 7.30 on a Sunday night at Dogwood Hills Farm. Dessert is underway, and the subject at hand is rhubarb. We have rhubarb in our backyard back home. You should pick it fresh and eat it. You'd be like, Woo! Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you ever eat fresh rhubarb? I did that too as a kid. I loved it. <laughs> we used to eat it all the time. Ooh. But you could I mean, you couldn't just like, you'd, you'd dare your friend, here, take a bite of this. Uh-huh. And they're like, no, what is it? Just, 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 just eat it. Just eat it. It's like so mm-hmm. tired. Of this. Just, oh my oh, gosh. God. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I loved it when I was a kid. Yeah, we did. Loved we it. ate it all the time. Mm-hmm. Ruthie so and Grace Pepler, along with Ruthie's husband, Thomas, Two guests from Texas and two volunteers from Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms, or WOLF, are finishing their servings of strawberry rhubarb pie, Italian cream cookies, and chocolate cake. All of it made fresh from scratch. Dinner included buttered yeast rolls, spinach salad, sweet potato risotto, and beef short ribs. Every bit of it, it should be noted, gluten-free, locally sourced, and fairly typical of dinner time at the Peplers. It also tastes as good as it sounds. But even though it requires some special sort of magic to make these sorts of meals every day, a feat that Ruthie attributes to prepping what she can in advance, like pie crusts and the always ready homemade ricotta, one of the biggest challenges is keeping it local. A few minutes before, as Ruthie made the buttermilk glaze for the Italian cream cookies, she explained how limiting it can be to rely exclusively on local sourcing. Very, very. Um, we had been doing those five course dinners and it was really hard to get everything that I needed and I felt like I was kind of stuck with the same few ingredients, you know, but then I spoke to some of my growers and they added in some different things. But it was like I had to commit to buying that because if they were going to plant it just for me and they couldn't sell it locally in the market, then 
what was I going to do? So Over the years, the Peplers' approach to their role as providers in the community has shifted. What started as simply feeding guests evolved into a brief stint preparing the aforementioned five-course meals, an annual cast-iron cook-off, nationwide delivery of goods, regular appearances on television, and on and on. Most recently, they've focused on the needs of people who are staying in hundreds of cabins up and down the Buffalo River. For our meals. So now we've shifted gears, and what do they want? So they want the lasagna already made. They want the gnocchi baked and ready to just pop in. So we worked with that over the last year and tried to narrow it down to all things that come from the farm. So a lot of dairy focus, our whole hand rolled pasta local meat that I know I can get a steady supply of ground beef like Ratchford Farms always has ground beef for me if I need it. So an 8x8 tin that's sealed really well they can heat it on the campfire or in the oven or spoon it out and heat it in the microwave. Whatever they've got when they get to where they're going. That was key. Yeah. Italian cream cookies. Okay, do you want to do that? A dozen. Yeah. This gets at the heart of serving a community's local ecosystem. <laughs> it's not just a matter of considering your own needs but the needs of your local producers, your neighbors and partners in the community. We've got mm, quite, our sources are good, they're steady. They know that we're steady. Like my greens come every Friday and I can use them. I, um, every now and then I'll tell them to pause it, but if I, if I don't get it and have it set aside for Friday, he can take it to the market and sell it. He'll sell out. But I'm trying to use what they have on hand all the time. That helps a lot. And you know, like if you've got a local farmer and they're sending three hogs to slaughter, they're only getting six tenderloins back. And if that's what they're doing every couple of months and all you want is tenderloins, that's not going to help them. So figuring out different cuts of meat that I can use and incorporate into my dinners and into my, you know, now most of it's the guest dinners. They all want to stay here for dinner. So we do breakfast, we do dinner, and you know, sometimes there's farming in between. Yeah, most days. <laughs> Sometimes it's simultaneous, so. Back at the dinner table, all the dessert plates have been wiped clean, and conversation continues. Right. No one is in a hurry to get up. This moment seems to represent what food means to the Peplers. It's community, and bringing people together, meeting people's needs, whether they're gluten-free or just want to learn more about where the food comes from. And for the Peplers, Food is an act of service, one that goes well beyond the supper table. For the Peplers, food is an act of service. In June, Ruthie will be providing that service alone for a while, as Gracie heads out of the country for a mission trip. We'll discuss how, even though the farm is family-run, profits at Dogwood Hills are still razor-thin. From full-on five-course dinners to lasagna ready-made for a riverside rendezvous, the Peplers are always evolving to better share the agricultural act of eating with their community. They understand that when those communities fray, the work of farmers becomes much more important and much more isolating. Some, like Darren Davis in Lakeview, Arkansas, have seen firsthand what happens when a fellow farmer feels abandoned by his community and his calling, leaving those like Darren wondering what more, if anything, they could have done. Producer Antoinette Grajeda has the story. Rich Arkansas Delta soil stretches for miles beneath an endless blue sky. A strong breeze is a welcome relief to a heat wave that's arrived in Phillips County where temperatures climb into the 90s. There's barely a cloud in the sky, just a few small wisps of cotton on the horizon, but rain is still on the mind of Darren Davis. A wet few months has meant a slow start to the growing season. <laughs> rain has been a lot. Yeah, it's been a lot. We, we're really, really behind. Uh, we're normally much further down the road than we are right now. So, but this week is dry and hot. So we'll we'll make it up. Yeah, we we we'll have to run some late nights, but we'll make it up. Darren knows not to curse the rain too much because he'll need it during the extreme heat of the Arkansas summer. No, I've learned over the years to be patient, to just sit and wait. That's all we can do anyway. So, 
but but yeah, it gets to be a little. I don't know the word for it. Uh, I won't say aggravated, aggravating, but it gets to be. It can get to be a little, little, little stressful when it gets over into May like it is. About 100 acres of corn and 150 acres of cotton have been planted. If it's dry enough today, they'll plant more cotton, but they're not running at full strength because of continuing equipment issues. The sprayer that broke during last month's visit is fixed with a new fuel injector line installed, but the tractor is still in the shop. They put a new engine in it. They test drove it for about a half a mile and the engine blew up again. Yeah, yeah, so it threw a rod. They, they, they drove it literally maybe a half a mile just on a test run, a brand new engine, about $30,000. And it lasted for about 15 minutes. So now they're putting a second engine in it. I mean, it's under warranty, of course, but you can't make up for the time that you're losing. Complicating matters are pandemic-related supply chain issues, preventing the shop from giving Darren a loaner tractor, selling him a new one, or purchasing parts to build one. It's a mess. It's, it's really a mess. Uh, so, so we're working two tractors when we're normally working three, and uh, that's been a problem. Countless farmers face problems just like Darren. If a farmer doesn't catch a break, it can begin to feel like you're sinking into the soggy soil waiting off your front porch. Sink far enough, and it's hard to fight back. Sink too far, and you start to feel hopeless. I had a really good friend uh, uh, that committed suicide uh, pertaining to farming. And it, 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 was, it was really devastating for us uh, as his friends, because he was a local farmer and a very good friend. So uh, this was maybe three years ago, I'm guessing, maybe four, three or four years ago. And uh, he and I talked and talked and we talked about it and talked about it. And, you know, at the end of the day, he still committed suicide. So that was pretty devastating for me and all my friends. Losses like this are devastating to small communities like Lakeview, where suicide is personal. But farmer suicide is a global problem with staggering statistics. According to a study from the University of Iowa, here in America, farmers and ranchers are three and a half times more likely than the general population to take their own lives. In 2018, The Guardian reported that in Australia, a farmer dies by suicide every four days, while it is twice as common in France. India has lost over a quarter of a million farmers to suicide since 1995. To help center himself on the hard days, Darren reflects on his father's wisdom. He had an expression back years ago. He would say, son, don't let this stuff get on the table with you. So, so he taught me well uh, as far as the ups and downs of farming. Today, Darren is focused on what he can do. He climbs into his silver pickup truck and follows behind one of his crew members, Jamel, who's driving a blue tractor to a 75-acre plot nearby. Darren helps Jamel line up a yellow implement called a rollicone on the planting rows. A gray coyote happily bounds across the property in the distance. They're plentiful in the area. The animal disappears as the tractor digs into the soil. Darren inspects the rows. While the ground is still a little damp, he says it's workable and they can continue preparing the land for planting. A sign of hope and the promise of progress. Darren Davis is made of grit. He has faced late winter weather, soggy soil, and failing equipment. Yet he persists, only letting problems within his control up on the table with him. When we catch back up with Darren in June, we'll discuss how weather and equipment delays begin to have a very real effect on his bottom line. It seems a successful growing season is both a game of patience and a race against the clock. For farmers like Darren, once the long hours of the growing season set in, success depends on picking your battles. Perpetual checklists grow longer with diet and self-care moving closer and closer to the bottom. Even at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, where unique farming practices focus on the health of the land and the livestock, 
Donna Kilpatrick finds the worse she eats, the less she sleeps, and the less sleep, the worse the cravings. Producer Hilary Trudell learns about breaking the cycle. I hope I'm coherent today. We did, um... Donna Kilpatrick is night. tired. We got home like 11.30, maybe? We started this morning at 6.30. But, yeah, we had, uh... About 60% of these steers had gains of over 100 pounds. Oh, wow. Since mid-March. So that's, that's, I mean, the season's just started with forage. So, I mean, we're in, we're in it. This is where they're going to get their gains. Donna is struggling with a feeling a lot of us know well. What's really bizarre is that, like, I fall asleep so quickly. Like, my head hits the pillow and I'm asleep. Last night, I tossed and turned and tossed and turned. I think I got about two hours sleep last night. Um, so it's that I used to drink and I don't drink anymore. I feel exactly like when you have a hangover. That's exactly what I feel like. Like the whirlies, um, like my head, like we were talking about it earlier. Like it feels exactly like a hangover. Her schedule doesn't really allow for much rest. It's one of those times where there are no days. There's just what you have to do next. Um, and I have EOV testing. I think we talked about that. The ecological outcome verification testing tomorrow, which means I have to get everything packed in the truck tonight and leave tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. So it's another super early morning. Oh, and then I'm speaking at a conference, which is sort of a big deal. It's a big conference, Regenerative Rising. Um, and I'm on a panel and also leading a discussion. Uh, and so it's not something I can just spout off some stats for it. So I have to be thoughtful about it. And I just realized that I have an axle or something broke on my gator, um, which I needed to take. I need to take that to, up to Missouri. I pull a trailer and bring it along. Um, so I don't know how we're going to get that fixed before then, but figure it out. We asked Donna about the EOV process. The first time we go to a farm, we do what's called long-term monitoring and short-term monitoring. So long-term monitoring, we're doing a test that's much more intensive, and we only do that test once every five years. Um, so it involves laying out these three transects, and then you're taking different tests at those transects. So. It's about a six hour process just for the long-term monitoring. And then on every farm they also have, we also have 10 what are called short-term monitoring sites. So uh, we randomly, with a, using a computer program that like randomly picks sites, um, drop posts in like markers, uh, they're actually GPS markers, um, into the ground so that we can come back to that exact spot the next year. Short-term monitoring is done every single year. The first time you do this, you're getting a baseline. It's a pretty quick test, uh, but it has to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just have to be on your A game when you do this. With so much to be aware of, we asked Donna what she eats to fuel her for all of her activity. Hydrate, water, water, water. But I'm not doing that. Right now I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Something like a veggie burger would be really good. Um, actually, broccoli sounds awesome right now. Oh. Some veggies. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but a milkshake also sounds really good. We wondered if Donna was unique in her network of farmers in terms of her diet. I think the, the everyone to be grown for grassroots has to deeply believe in raising the best livestock possible for consumers because the standards are so incredibly high. They want the best for their animals, they want the best for their land, um, and they want to do it in a way where they're profitable. And she sees that kind of pride every day. Like we, it's funny, we have, a, we have a person that's with us this week, and she helped with chicken catch last night, and she's helped with chicken chores this week, and she commented, I had no idea this much work goes into raising a pasture-based bird. They should cost $500 a piece like based on her experience of working with them for the week. Through long days and nights, Donna's support system keeps her going. We have a system. We, we stay at the ranch most of the time, and I don't know if we talked about this before, but our big outing is on Saturdays we go pick up our produce that we order from Arkansas Local Food Network. It shows up at a church. Liz orders it all the week before. We go pick it up, and then we go to the natural grocer, and we come home, and that's our, or, I mean, that's not true. We usually do something fun while we're out. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's, you know, that's where we're getting our food. Sometimes, hope, as, many, as many times as possible from our own garden here. 
Liz takes care of all that stuff and I just go along and throw in, in the basket some special things that I want. I'm sure there's a lot more planning involved than I'm aware of and I probably should say thank you more often. Just for health reasons, we stopped drinking about two and a half years ago. And I feel like the focus on really like being conscious of what we're putting in our body sort of shifted at that point. And I literally had a salad the other night with no meat on it that was far superior to this, is it Wagyu beef? Mm -hmm. Local, grass finished. That salad was 500 times better. Through work and finding time to eat, Donna and Liz are also carving out time to have fun. And you all saw a band there, right? Yeah, we saw St. Paul and the Broken Bones. How was it? It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It was a great venue too, and we're really up front. And still find time for adventure. Dad, oh, right. yeah, we're gonna go now. help Liz's dad, sort of. But that's sort of a vacation, because I don't know if I told you I bought a small Airstream, and it's in Massachusetts, so I'm gonna bring it back. Nice. Um, so there's a little bit of, I'm, seeing him will be fantastic too, but then bringing home the Airstream, I think is gonna be a lot of fun. Doesn't that make two Airstreams? Well, one's for sale, if anyone's interested. <laughs> In June, we'll hear from Donna on how a surprising and unwelcome COVID diagnosis hammered her June plans, and how staying home and staying active got her through it. After years on the land, Donna's palate has changed. The cravings for steamed broccoli are just as enticing as those for bratwurst. With the help of her wife, Liz, Donna has taught herself to crave healthier food. Family can be a powerful motivator for breaking bad habits. As Will and Rachel Norton stock their shelves for the coming week, Will sees spread out before him proof of his victory over a poor diet. Rachel and the kids are a constant reminder of what he's fighting for. Producer Jordan Hickey has the story. The Norton's kitchen looks pretty similar to most any other American kitchen. Spread across the counter are economy-sized boxes of fruit roll-ups and ring pops and goldfish crackers and a box of donuts, and, oddly, several bunches of bananas. But here Rachel and Norton describe it. This isn't what the family's countertops usually look like. The snack food is left over from that morning's charity adventure race in Snowball, 40 miles to the southeast, where the Nortons run an Airbnb and are raising funds to rebuild a historic gymnasium. <laughs> no, um, the donuts are a special treat. We just get those occasionally. You know, bananas are a fruit. We try to keep bananas and apples and occasionally grapes and things like that. Goldfish, we went through a goldfish phase. We're kind of out of it. We're kind of cheese at people now. That's a good snack. Um, I'm just going to tell you all the food we have. <laughs> to really get a sense of how the Nortons are eating, however, one need only look beyond the countertop to an antique window hung on the wall. Inside the panes are the days of the week, and on the eighth pane, the word menu. On this week's menu, ham, at least in part. Tomorrow we'll have ham, and Cal, can you go see what kind of vegetables we have? Yeah. Please, go look in the freezer in the middle and tell me what we got. Um, we've got some stir-fry vegetables that got left over from the weekend, so we'll probably do a stir-fry, a chicken stir-fry, on Wednesday. And we'll probably have breakfast on Tuesday. Is it okay with you, Will? Yep. And we always have hash browns, eggs. Okay, so you want peas and carrots? Yeah. Okay, we'll come back, please. Um, we'll have biscuits. And we'll have ham, because it's on the menu. It's extra. And let's see. Bananas. Bananas, bananas, bananas. Rachel goes to the family freezer and pulls out a side of ham, roughly the size of a small coffee table. So here's our freezer, and it's full of beef on the top, pork in the middle, some good old-fashioned chocolate ice cream, the vegetable drawer. Um, yeah. And here's a ham. 
It's large enough that it won't fit in the crockpot, she says, so she'll have to roast it in the oven. The ham sighs, and the Norton scheduled menu reflects a pair of truths that apply to most of their grocery choices. The more they can get from friends and neighbors, the better. And the less they have to go into town, the better. This sounds really stupid, but it's hard for us to go to the grocery store because he's busy during the day. I work during the day. And then I drive, since I drive a work truck, it's, I can't just go to the grocery store on the way home from work. I have to come home, go back to town to get my groceries. So it makes it, it's a little harder than just, oh, well, I'll stop on my way home and get groceries. It doesn't work that way here. In stark contrast to the well-balanced meals written on the window pane is how Will used to eat before he and Rachel married. Before the window pane, there was a whiteboard. Before the whiteboard, there was a tendency to not eat quite so well. As a younger man and bachelor farmer, Will had a diet that wasn't as well balanced. I used to eat once a day. Um, whatever mom and dad had, I'd swing by there and eat. But I don't know, it was probably not near as healthy as it is now. Lots of soup, easy, easy stuff to fix. I'd usually gone for a day or two at a time and uh, you'd drive a lot. So you didn't really eat because it'd make you tired. I just didn't eat, didn't have time to eat in the mornings or lunch. I didn't like doing dishes. I'd stop my mom. My mom was one of them, you'd call her at 11 o'clock at night and say, hey, I'm hungry. She'd get up and fix you something. So that I'd eat and go home or sleep on her sofa. You didn't push it, but you might get something warm. <laughs> Actually there for a long time, I, I remember I didn't like any warm meals because I never had any. For so long, uh, you'll kind of get where you don't like stuff hot and you develop a taste for cold food. It's all that same old deal. It's highly overrated. Although Will sometimes slips back into his once a day habits, and one might be surprised it doesn't happen more often, the antique window pane on the kitchen wall serves as a reflection of the healthier everyday choices Will is trying to make for his farm and for his family. In June, Will and Rachel will be feeling the heat set in. Their successful season is beginning to boom. But the Nortons know that more profits and a bigger operation mean higher costs, which can become staggering in the 2022 economy. When your season is going as smoothly as Will and Rachel's, everyday choices, like a healthy diet, are easier to make. Farmers having a harder time are often preoccupied with bigger, more troubling stresses than the dinner table. Dr. Teresa Hudson spoke on this feeling just last month. If you're depressed and, and really have a lot of anxiety or, or you're really just super stressed, how do you know you're making good financial decisions, good decisions about your children or your, your spouse or your business? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Producer Antoinette Grajeda visited with Larry Galligan in West Fork as he rebuilt a water pump and wrestled with a life-changing decision looming on the horizon. The wind is doing very little to cool Larry Galligan as he troubleshoots a broken water pump behind his green 2000 Ford Ranger in his backyard. After dropping his son off at school, Larry grabbed whatever parts he could find at three different stores. Dressed in cargo shorts and a black t-shirt, he's sorting through a pile of white and gray PVC pipes and fittings sprawled across his truck's tailgate in search of a solution. Temperatures are on the rise and there's been no measurable rainfall for two weeks. I have irrigation that is not completely functional and it needs to become functional like yesterday. And so, we can't put anything else into the ground until we can put water on it because it just, it'll die. So the goal is to get water functioning because at least if transplants are still lingering on in flats, you can move them, you can water them with a hose, you can put them all in one place, you can put them in shade if you need to. Um, once they're in the ground, it's a whole different story. Unfortunately, this project will have to wait because a large white charter bus full of master gardeners has just arrived. They've come to tour the farm as part of the group's state conference. 
Larry agreed to the visit over a year ago, but it was postponed due to COVID concerns. He makes his way onto the air-conditioned bus and greets his guests using the vehicle's microphone. My name is Larry Galligan. This is Riverside Specialty Farm in West Fork. We uh, are 17 acres land altogether, but we produce on about really an acre. Um, we try to be an intensive three season vegetable farm. We took about nine months off in 2021. We are just coming back into production now. More than we 30 people, behind. many wearing hats and name tags, follow Larry around the farm, observing his growing blocks and high tunnels, one of which is still under construction. The knowledgeable crowd discusses growing tomatoes, weed control, and the importance of fences. I have a fence building business as well. And I thought, why am I building a fence for everyone else and not myself, right? So we finally got around to building a, a deer fence and it night and day difference, you know, like almost no losses to animals anymore, except for crows one year. The crows went crazy and there's nothing you can do about crows. The tour is over as quickly as it began, and after his guests depart, Larry sits down on the steps of his back porch and lets out a sigh of relief. This afternoon has been the culmination of a lot of stress that's been building up. Working on time management, balancing family and work life, and planning a trip to Philadelphia next month. Actually, this morning I, I woke up and was sort of wringing my hands over everything that was going on, and actually I feel... Now that this is done, I, I feel pretty good. I'm a lot more relaxed than I was earlier. Another potential stress or solution, depending on your point of view, is the possibility of a new full-time job. Larry had an interview two days ago, and if he gets the position, it will change the trajectory of farm work this season. So I have to keep that in the back of my mind now too. Like I've already decided, okay, well, if I do get this job, this, this, and this just goes away. You know, so like, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop growing tomatoes. We're committed on the high tunnels, but we're not gonna grow another leafy green again. Nothing that requires a lot of handling. Larry hasn't been actively seeking another job, but has entertained opportunities like this when presented with them. While he enjoys farming, it's challenging, and there are benefits to having a job with consistent hours and a steady income. Just like the more than half of American farmers who work second jobs to make ends meet, Larry says he's been unable to get where he'd like to be financially with the farm. We were almost there, and then it, I just kind of lost hold of it and could never get back. And, you know, everyone's like, well, you need help. Well, yeah, you got to have money to buy to pay help, though, you know, and you got to... You know, and then you got to spend time managing people instead of just doing things. And then, yeah, and we're not a huge operation. I've kept it together before, but it's just, you know, it's just the numbers haven't worked like they have in the past. And so I enjoy it and want to keep doing it. I don't want to, I'm, I'm invested in it enough. I don't want to stop, but, you know, I don't want to keep, keep working this hard for, very little, you know, reward out of it either. For now, he'll focus on the issue at hand, the broken water pump. He returns to tinkering with the equipment in the back of his truck and dismisses, if for only a moment, his earlier stresses. He can worry about those another day. Countless farmers face struggles just like Larry's, but few have the chance at full-time work in another career. That chance of security and consistency for his family, it's not easily dismissed. When we catch back up with Larry in June, we'll see if he takes the full-time job offer and just what that decision means for his well-being and peace of mind. For livestock farms across the state, an animal's well-being is often better attended than the farmer's. Healthy diet choices for the cattle in the field are more clear than those for the family at the table. Producer Hilary Tridell caught up with Rachel and John Michael Bearden working the hay fields to get an idea of what's on the menu this spring, both farm and family. This day kind of got bumbuzzled. Our pastor, who is our neighbor, who his son works for us. Who we just drove past us. Yes. yes. Yeah. He stuck his tractor in at their house and so this morning i came over here and i started cutting and i went back home and we went to go pull him out with that tractor and got that tractor stuck. 
We followed Rachel from the local gas station down a network of dirt roads and into a field where John Michael hops out of a tractor to greet us. We're seeing another part of the Fowler Bearden operation. Hey. This is one of our custom bailing uh, jobs that we do. Basically, we manage it for the guy who owns it. And he takes all the hay off of it, but we pretty well have control to do with it as we please. Mm -hmm. It's a little short for what I like. It it won't make as much production, but uh, the hay quality is there. And so we're going ahead and cutting it for quality and not quantity. And uh, trying to get this filled, the next filled, and then there's one more. We proceeded to get a tutorial of this humble yet mighty crop. So when it comes down to it, it's quality or quantity is the big thing that hay farmers have to kind of balance. When you look at the energy that's in a plant, the taller it gets, the less digestible it becomes for the cow. Because there's more fiber in it, right? The taller it gets, just like if you want to eat a high protein snack, you go get seeds of something, not the lettuce leaf or a celery stalk, right? So grass is the same way. The taller it gets, the more digestibility it loses. But then if you go out there and try to mow a six inch tall field, yeah, there's a lot of nutrients there, but there's not enough quantity to be worth your time. So there's this balance there. Okay. So the ideal way to cut hay would be right before it heads out into a seed. That's when it's at it's got its most quality and it hasn't moved all those nutrients over into the seed head yet. The problem with that is, especially in our neck of the woods, or like John Michael is a hay producer, he's got so many acres to cover, a lot of it's ready at a lot of the same time. Right. Because when it's time, it's time. But what does it do for a cow? Hay is basically a substitute for, it's a forage. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, in the spring, depending on how well you manage, you're grazing cattle most of the time, right? Well, what happens in the winter when there's not grass for them to graze? So what this is, is we're taking an abundance of forage that we have now, because our cows can't keep up with it theoretically, or like this farm in particular, he doesn't run cows on this farm at all for his management, but you don't want this grass to go to waste. So we cut it, we let it stay here on the ground till it dries, that way it doesn't sour or mold or things ferment in the bale. Then it's baled up and we store it for those winter months when there's not grass, this is what we give them instead. Right. This is like we're filling up the cover. How do they view their ever diversifying routine? Organized chaos. Yeah. Is the best one I had to describe it. Since he came home full time, it's made a huge difference. Okay. Because like in the mornings, he handles a little bit while I go to work. Mm-hmm. I try to be off in time to grab her in the evenings because then he's in the hay field. And lots of times kind of Sunday evening, it's like, okay, what does this week look like? We kind of decide who's going to tackle what. You know, if she needs help this week, I, I can know. Or if there's an afternoon, um, evening event she's putting on, it's okay, I'll get a little bit and I'll make those arrangements. When I was teaching, it, it was chaos because I was driving a bus and I would leave the house by six o'clock and then get home about five. And she had to deal with a little bit by herself. And um, I came to a farm and it was take care of it, take care of it. and. I miss the paycheck, but I don't miss the scheduling mess that it created. Because it did, it put a divide in our relationship. And it was tough having all of that on your shoulders and trying to make time for each other. And And I think a big part of it is communication. Like when we wrap up a project or like when I leave work for the day, I pick the phone up and call and say, hey, what do I need to grab in town before I come that way? Or where do I need to meet you for this? Or We stay pretty close in contact most of the day, and I think that helps quite a bit. How do the Beardens fuel themselves for so much activity? We're going to go to Fat Boys on Saturday night for a steak. Okay. I don't cook. I got two places that I eat. I eat at the Mexican restaurant and Fat Boys, and they know me when I walk in. I'm either going to get a grilled chicken sandwich, or I'm going to get a steak, or at the Mexican restaurant, I'm going to get two chicken tacos and a beef enchilada, and I'm happy. (laughs) And that's like you asked about juggling Mm -hmm. all the things. I would say that the biggest ball that I let drop and hit the ground and don't worry about is those traditional housewife kinds of things. Because I would rather come home in the evening and spend time in the barn or helping check cows or do those kinds of things. I really don't want to go inside and clean house and cook dinner. And when we try to buy groceries and plan like we're going to cook dinner, we don't. A cow will go haywire and we're having to go get cows up. 
or something will break down, some catastrophe will be going on and we still don't get done till eight o'clock. And you look at each other and say, do you really want to cook dinner? If I asked, do you want to do dishes if I cook dinner? The nights that I have to keep a little bit, we'll go eat there some nights. And they can tell the nights that I'm frazzled with so much other stuff going on and they're like, come here Lexi Grace and they'll take her up and they'll go and let me just have time to compress her. Even when we're together, just us alone time. Someday she'll go sit down at the front desk and help check people out as the cashier at color. And we just have a dinner alone and it's kind of nice. <laughs> like so much the Beardens do, they see food and quality time as essential teaching tools for the young person in their orbit. And the biggest thing for me is I don't care what we have for dinner. I don't care where we go. I don't care if I cook or we go eat somewhere. I want to have dinner around the table as a family. And I think that's something, even when Brandon's with us or our barn kids, we might go out to Fat Boys and have a table of six because we're not gonna go send these teenagers to fend for themselves. We're gonna gather everybody up, we're gonna sit around the table, we're gonna pray before we eat, we're gonna put the phones away and have a family meal. And I don't care where it's at, but that's, that's a big thing for me. As we say goodbye to the Beardens, we are invited to the big table. You wanna come at lunchtime and we'll take you to Fat Boys. Maybe we'll see what all the fuss is about. When we catch back up with the Beardens in June, we'll hear how Rachel uses her position at the U of A Extension Office to help guide other farmers in her community through this tumultuous season. Whether they're planning an early cutting of hay or pulling a local preacher from the ditch, it's no wonder Rachel and John Michael have a hard time cooking a family meal every evening. And they're not alone. The average American eats a fast meal from a restaurant almost six times per week. And while eating at a restaurant isn't inherently unhealthy, research shows that an average of 60% of restaurant meals are detrimental to your health. So what are the signs that your diet needs to be addressed? And what kinds of consequences does poor diet have on our bodies and our minds? Arkansas PBS producer Corey Womack finds out more from registered dietitian Chelsea Tull. Today we are uh, talking to Chelsea Tull. You're a dietitian and a nutritionist, uh -huh. and so we're focused specifically um, on stress for farmers. Mm -hmm. Stress and diet, like how are these two things kind of related and and can they be detrimental to each other? Absolutely. So when your stress levels are higher, you're actually producing more cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And the more cortisol that you have in the body, one, it affects your um, cravings for unhealthy foods. So things that are higher in fat, sugar, salt, things that are not quite good for you, those are the things that we want when our cortisol levels are high. Also, um, that extra cortisol also helps hinders us from losing weight the way that we want to. I think a lot of people think farmers out in the field mm -hmm. working with heavy equipment, I think a lot of people think they're just naturally fit. Mm -hmm. Can't outwork a bad diet. So that that's right. really what it comes down mm -hmm. to. And then, you know, sometimes stress also tends to make us want to, you know, reach for those comfort foods and mm -hmm. things that are, again, not going to fuel your body very right. efficiently. Absolutely. No, we, we like I said, we're following six farmers mm -hmm. this year. And, and I think the main barrier for for so many people, including our farmers, mm -hmm. is is that higher cost. Yeah. What are some things that you might recommend? Uh, I mean, how do you eat healthy on a budget? One is shopping sales and shopping things when they're in season. So, of course, when you buy things that are in season, produce that's in season, you're going to get it cheaper. Buy it in bulk if you're able to. Utilize your freezer space. So when you freeze vegetables or fruits um, or any kind of produce at its peak ripeness, when you thaw it to get ready to eat it, you're still going to get that same amount, amount of nutrients as you would otherwise. Shop the sales as much as you can. You can also, you know, again, utilize, um, you know, hunting season. A lot of people are, you know, doing that. So, you know, you can get a deer. That's a great lean source of meat. Utilize that freezer space as much as you can. Are there nutritional benefits to eating organically and, and fresher foods? Things that are more highly processed, you're mm -hmm. going to end up with a lot more sodium and, uh, you know, fats, things to help preserve that shelf life. Whereas the fresher foods, things that, you know, come on, grow from the ground, you pull it right out, you eat it, prep it, whatnot, um, that's going to be healthier for you because you're not getting that extra fat, sodium, sugar, whatnot that they're going to use to preserve those things. If your barrier to entry is the only thing that I can do is something that's not organic, you know, maybe I'm looking at an organic produce versus a non-organic produce, any produce is better than none. Right. So... 
we talked to a farmer this month who uh, she was preparing for a conference mm-hmm. and she she had some broken down equipment and uh, she even starts the interview saying I hope I'm coherent because I didn't get any sleep mm-hmm. last night. Uh, how does yeah. that kind of affect our dietary? Lack of sleep can also lead to higher cortisol levels, which again cause you to crave those foods that are not quite so healthy for you. And then a lot of times too, we tend to compensate for lack of sleep with adding something extra, so something sugary. Um, you know, you'll see people who are like, "Well, you know, I didn't get much sleep tonight, so I'm going to slam the extra coffee." If it's just regular coffee that you're drinking, may not be so bad. But if it's, you know, the sugary, that can be pretty detrimental to your health, as well as things like soda, which are, you know, much higher in sugar. Um, the more of those that you're going to drink, the, you know, the worse off it is for you. So, I mean, somebody high blood pressure. I mean, I know, like, like somebody pre-diabetic, somebody uh-huh. that they're, you know, man, your A1C is coming mm-hmm. back real high several times. Um What's the game? I mean, what are we cutting out? Of course, everyone's plan is going to be a little bit individualized, but let's say, you know, it is it is the pre-diabe- pre-diabetes that we're looking at. We're going to look at lowering your amount of carbs and refined carbs specifically, um, increasing things like whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, and then really focusing on that lean protein as well to mm-hmm. try and get that blood sugar lowered. And that's really, I mean, maybe even more than a di- a, a pre-diabetic diet. Mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds just like a healthy diet all around. Overall, I mean, it sounds like, yeah. I mean, would that be the game plan for somebody with high blood pressure Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we really kind of focus on, you know, t- the more of like the Mediterranean style of eating. Um, and then USDA actually has a tool called MyPlate. So you remember the food pyramid? I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they've actually rebranded it and totally flipped it up on its head to make it way more user-friendly. Um, so you can find this at choosemyplate.gov. But it's a graphic of a plate, and it is divided up into four sections. So one of those is fruits, a quarter fruit, a quarter vegetables, a quarter protein, a quarter starch. That is what we really start with with most patients as a beginning point to say, okay, this is what your ideal plate should look like. Now tell me what it actually looks like and what are some things that we can do to try to make it look like awesome. this. Yeah. So so if if I'm a farmer, um, particularly in y'all's region, mm-hmm. and and I'm I'm feeling this fatigue, I'm feeling this loss of sleep, and I, I know I'm probably not eating as I should. Uh, how do I reach out? Where do I go? Yeah, so um, you can find us at selineweightloss.org. You're going to find our online seminar there, which just explains a little bit more about each of the procedures and the non-surgical options also. Um, I will say we are an accredited program, so we're very, very proud of that. So... Mm-hmm. There are certain standards and guidelines that we have to uphold to. What that means for patients is that when they come to see us, they are in a safe place. Uh, you know, our motto at Celine Health System is friends and family, taking care of friends and family. And we take that very, very seriously and very literally. <laughs> thanks so much. I mean, uh, not only as a diabetic, but as an Arkansan, yes. thanks so much uh, for the work you're doing uh, to keep folks healthy. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Whether it's a plate of greasy enchiladas at Rachel and John Michael Bearden's local Mexican restaurant, or a quick visit to Burger King on Donna Kilpatrick's drive to her next conference. Whether it's a well-orchestrated five-course dinner at Dogwood Hills, or a week's menu hastily written on an antique window in Will and Rachel Norton's dining room. The agricultural act of eating is no easier to manage for farmers than it is for the rest of us. Food is often disregarded for more pressing matters, putting our health and our future in jeopardy. So what is there to do? Try remembering the words of Darren Davis' father. When it comes to the worry and struggle you can't control, don't let this stuff get on the table with you. Instead, fill the table with healthy food, family and friends, and if you can find a lull in the conversation, remember to thank a farmer. The Founders of the Feast. Next month, we'll catch back up with our farmers working in the June sun. We'll also speak with Dr. Ron Rainey, Director of the Southern Education Risk Management Center in Little Rock, on the continuing financial hurdles our farmers are facing in 2022. The growing season is funded through a Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network grant provided by the United States Department of Agriculture and administered by the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. This episode was written and directed by Corey Womack of Arkansas PBS. Our stories are covered by journalists Antoinette Grajeda and Jordan Hickey, as well as Hillary Trudell, 
Omaya Jones, and Andy Vaught of the Yarn Storytelling Initiative. Audio mastering was done by engineer Tracy Prince. This podcast is an Arkansas PBS production. I'm your host, Ben Dickey, and this has been The Growing Season. If you enjoyed these stories, please review our podcast and be sure to follow Arkansas PBS on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.